Hey, everybody. I'm Alan Seals with the Talks at Google program. Thank you for coming out on this wonderful move and movie day. This is can't beat live theater. This is wonderful. Um, so without further ado, winner of the Tony Triple Crown for Best Musical, Best Score, and Best Book, Avenue Q is part flesh, part felt, and packed with heart. Please welcome the cast of Avenue Q. An afternoon alone with my favorite book, Broadway musicals of the 1940s. No roommate to bother me. How could it get any better than this? Oh, hi, Rod. Hi, Nikki. <laughs> hey, Rod. You'll never guess what happened to me on the subway this morning. This guy was smiling at me and talking to me. Mm, that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. He was being real friendly. Mm. And, uh, you know, I think he was coming on to me. I think he might have thought I was gay. <laughs> So why are you telling me this? Why should I care? I don't care. What'd you have for lunch today? Oh, Rod, there's no need to get all defensive. I'm not getting defensive. What do I care about some gay guy you met? Hmm? I am trying to read. Oh. Well, I didn't mean anything by it, Rod. I just think it's something we should be able to talk about. <laughs> well, I do not want to talk about it, OK, Nikki? This conversation is over. Yeah, but Rod, over. Okay, but just so you know, if you were gay, that'd be okay. I mean, cause hey, ah, I'd like you anyway. Because you see, if it were me, I would feel free to say that I was gay, but I'm not gay. Nikki, please, I am trying to read. What? If you were queer, Nikki. I'd still be here. Nikki, I'm trying to read this book. Year after year, Nikki. because you're dear to me. Uh, and I know that you what? would accept me too. Wait, what? If I told you today, hey, guess what? I'm gay, but I'm not gay. Uh, I'm <laughs> happy just being with you. My button shoes, pal Joey. So what should it matter to me? What you do in bed with guys? Nikki, that is gross! No, it's not! If you were gay, oh, I'd I shout, Hooray! I am not listening! Right there, la, 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 la. I wouldn't get in your way. Ah! You can count on me to always be beside you every day to tell you it's okay. You were just born that way, and as they say, it's in your DNA, you're gay! If you were gay. Okay, bye, Ron. I'll be back. This way. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm Veronica Kuhn, and I play Kate Monster. And this next song is about Kate, who has become a kindergarten teaching assistant. She's about to teach her very first class by herself. She would like to talk about the internet. And Trekkie Monster has some other ideas. <laughs> Finally, I get to teach a whole lesson all by myself. And I'm going to teach something modern, something relevant. The internet. The internet is really, really great. For porn. I got a fast connection so I don't have to wait. For porn. There's always some new site. For porn. I browse all day and night. For porn. It's like I'm surfing at the speed of light. For porn. Trekkie. The internet is for porn. Trekkie. The internet is for porn. What are you doing? Why you think the net was born? Porn, porn, porn. Trekkie monster. Wah, wah. Get over here. Yeah, yeah. You are ruining my song. Oh, me sorry, me no mean to. Well, if you wouldn't mind, please being quiet for a minute so I can finish. Okie dokie. Good. I'm glad we have this new technology. For porn. Oh, which gives us untold opportunity. For porn. Uh, Oops, right from your own desktop. 
Or you can research, browse, and shop until you've had enough and you're ready to stop. For poor. The internet is for poor. No. The internet is for poor. Trekkie. Me up all night honking the horn to porn. Porn, porn. Oh, that is gross. You're a pervert. Ah, sticks and stones, Kate Monst. No, really, you're a pervert. Normal people don't sit at home and look at porn on the internet. <laughs> what? You have no idea. Ready, normal people? Ready! 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 Let me hear it. Internet internet is for porn. Porn. Sorry, Kate. The internet is for porn. Masturbate. Oh. All these guys unzip their flies for porn. Porn, porn, porn. No, no, porn, no. porn. Hold on a second. Uh, now I happen to know for a fact that you, Rod, check your portfolio and trade stocks online. That's correct. And Brian, you buy things on Amazon.com. Sure. And Gary, you keep selling your possessions on eBay. Yes, I do. <laughs> and Princeton, you sent me that sweet online birthday card. True. Ah, uh, but Kate, what do you think he do after? <laughs> the internet is for porn. Oh, the internet is for porn. I Grab your dick and double click <laughs> for porn, porn, porn. Oh, porn. porn. of the show, Kate Monster, who has just broken up with her boyfriend, asked my character, ah, microphone, uh, Christmas Eve, who is a Japanese therapist, for our love advice. Why can't people get along and love each other, Christmas Eve? You think getting along same as loving? Sometimes love, right where you're hating most, Kate Monster. The more you love someone, the more you want to kill them. The more you love someone, the more he makes you cry. So you are life for making peace with them and loving. That's why you love so strong you like to make him die. The more you love. Someone, the more he make you claim he. The more you love someone, the more you wishing him dead. Sometimes you'd get him and only if he fat and lazy. And wanting a baseball bat for hitting him on his head. And hate, and hate, they like to brother. Kate Monster, Hi. can I speak with you for a second? Sure. Okay. Can I come over there? Yes, please. Okay. They can set up our chairs for us. Um, so in the show, if you guys have not seen, there is a, a, a seductress who comes and um, steals your man at one point. She uh, does. How do you How do you feel about Lucy coming and taking your man? Well, she's a slut. 
<laughs> did you know that, that her full name is Lucy the Slut? I did not, know. That's her full name, Lucy the Slut. And that's how I feel about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so, thank you. The, the love scene that you have with Princeton on stage. Oh, yeah. Yes. Um, the first time you had to have sex with Princeton on stage, were you nervous? Well, I was a little nervous, but um, we were drinking a lot. So that actually made it better. <laughs> <laughs> we had some Long Island iced teas. <laughs> we did. Lucy was not there for that, right? No, she wasn't. We saw her perform earlier, and then we had some drinks, and I took Princeton home with me. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Outside of the show, are you are you friends with all the other monsters? Oh yes, yes, all the monsters, Jackie. But um, also, there's Rod and Nikki and and Princeton and everybody. But we are we are all friends. We live on Avenue Q. Well, very nice. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you. Th nice to meet everyone. <laughs> uh, Rod, can I speak with you for a second? Absolutely. <clears throat> So you and Ricky, the other the other gentleman in the show, mm -hmm. um, you're among the first couples to be married outside City Hall with the passage of the same-sex marriage laws in New York State, correct? That's correct. Um, so what was this experience like for you? Um, well, uh, groundbreaking to say the least. Um, you know, as, as one of the first gay couples in New York City to be married, we were also the first puppet couple to be married too. <laughs> so that felt like we were really groundbreaking for that as well. So do you think now that being openly gay helps others come out and deal with their own sexuality? Absolutely. And I hope that other puppets come out too. You know, it's very hard in the puppet world to come out. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Trekkie, can I speak with you? Careful. Yeah. Oh, careful, careful. Um, Trekkie, do you ever have moments where you feel like you are beside yourself? Yes. <laughs> Sometimes backstage, it feels like there's five or six of me. And you <laughs> happen to pop out at the same time. <laughs> um, do you ever have like freak out moments when you look to your left or your right and one of your hands just doesn't work? What? Wait, this, no, this one or this one? No, my hands do exactly what me want them to do. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> And so you are a very good uh, investor, a businessman, correct? Oh, yes. What, what is your primary investment? Porn. Good, thank you. Yeah. All right, thank you. <laughs> thank All right, you. Uh, everybody, please excuse the puppets. They have to there be somewhere All else. Right. And now, human skin people, feel free to come up and join me. Human skin. Can you guys go down the line and just introduce yourselves and what characters you play? Uh, sure, I'm Darren Bluestone, and I play Princeton and Rod. I'm Danielle Thomas, and I play Gary Coleman. Yes, that Gary Coleman. <laughs> I'm Nicholas Kahn, and I play Brian. <laughs> My name is Sala Iwamatsu, and I play Christmas Eve. Veronica Kuhn, I play Kate Monster, and Lucy the Slut. It's me. I'm Jason Jacoby. I play Nikki, Trekkie Monster, and a couple other characters that are not here today. <laughs> I'm Jennifer Barnhart. I uh, am sort of the puppet utility girl. I right hand pretty much everybody, but I also play a school teacher, Kate Monster's boss, and her name is Mrs. Thistletwat. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm Jed Resnick, and I am the ensemble, and I understudy uh, all the boys in the show, and I have two mics. <laughs> nice. So. Congratulations on reaching 10 years. The show hit 10 years back in July, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. So what's the, what's the run of the show? Six years on Broadway, now four years um, off-Broadway. What's the difference between what makes on and on versus off? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's absolutely no difference in the show. It's same uh, set. Same set. Uh, Jen Barnhart, original Broadway cast member, is here again. Uh, and the three of us closed it on Broadway, reopened it off-Broadway, and we're still here. Uh, so it's the same cast, same puppets. The real difference is the, is the seat numbers. Uh, right. The difference between Broadway and off-Broadway. 500 seats and above is Broadway. 499 and below is off-Broadway. We have 498. Um, we do. <laughs> and every night we think about plugging two more seats in there. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's pretty much the main difference. So in the very beginning, back back you know in, in the initial days, it was going through um, you know the show goes through workshops and, and picks up steam. Like what did you, the, I guess Jen is the, the only original cast member. Like do you remember you remember that far back ten years ago when like when the show picked up steam and when when did you really feel like this was going to be something? Uh, 
when the reviews first came out? I mean, well, I had first of all seen the show in a reading in the basement at the York Theater uh, even two years before I was in the show and thought, this is brilliant. I think one of the things that uh, makes this show so strong is that it took so long to develop. It was about two and a half years in development before it, we did the original off-Broadway run. Um, but uh, when I was doing it, I thought, this is hilarious, this is brilliant, I hope people get it. Uh, and audiences loved it, and New York theater-going audiences specifically adored it, and it became the thing to see. So the tourists didn't know who we were, but New York theater people were going, oh my god, have you seen Avenue Q? You have to see it. It's brilliant, it's brilliant. Uh, and we got a love letter from Brent Brantley in the New York Times, and uh, that was when we sort of thought, hey, I think we got something here, and shortly thereafter, we announced we were moving uptown to Broadway, so it was pretty great. So what changed, what changed between the workshops, the, the initial rehearsals and opening? Believe it or not, not a whole heck of a lot. Uh, the, some of the strongest songs in the show were the first written. Uh, Gay was written very early on. Racist was written very early on. Um, you know, having, having said that, having said that, I mean, once we got it to that stage, uh, the original opening night gift when we transferred Uptown to Broadway was, uh, from the book writer, was a collection of all of the scenes and material and song snippets that had been cut from the show, and that was 126 pages. So once we got it to that place, you know, then, then we were off and running, so, but yeah, I, and now that I say that, I go, yeah, actually, we did have a lot of changes. It just is a blur. Because when you're in previews, you're rehearsing during the day and then doing the show at night, and then you go in and they say, okay, that didn't work. We've got a whole new bunch of pages for you to learn, so they throw new material at us, and then we do it in the show that night, and then the same process over and over again. So, wow. oh, so okay, so you, hum you human skin actors, uh, Nick, Daniel, Sal Sala, um, what was it like getting used to interacting with the puppets directly? Like, you look at them on stage, right? Not, not the actors holding them. Well, the funny thing is, now it's actually the complete opposite. If you ever look at a person, you're like, that's weird to look at a person. <laughs> you're used to looking at the puppets. And Kate is my favorite. We're, Gary and Kate, we're really close. I think she kind of <laughs> likes me. She hasn't had a black man yet, but I'm going to change that really <laughs> <laughs> What? <laughs> but yeah, I mean, at first you're like, uh, uh. Oh, a person puppet, but then after a while, because the puppet, the, we have amazing, amazing puppeteers. Like they go through a lot of work to learn how to make these puppets come to life, and they are. They're alive and they're real, and so you can't help but feel for these inanimate objects. So you play to the puppets and the people. Ah, eh, don't matter. Yeah, I, I remember initially, it was it was a little strange being in rehearsals and talking to a puppet and having. I mean, the puppets are so gorgeous and they have such expression. It's not that hard for that long, but it was a little bit like, oh my, this is a, a thing that's in my face and it's really like, got big eyes and they're, they're gorgeous, but it is, kind of, it is a different transition, I think, talking. No, I thought the ops, I thought they were, the puppets were the best actors yeah. I've ever worked <laughs> with. No, sorry. Um, <laughs> they just, you know, it's almost like looking at a puppy. They look at you with these eyes yeah. and there's just unconditional love. There's not judgment. So when I joined the company, I came into the company and other people were like, oh, let's see if this girl can do it. Whereas the puppets were like, oh, you know, it's so, so <laughs> <laughs> I have some problems, but, you know, No judgment, right? No, no judgment. <laughs> so for the, the puppeteers, is it, what was it like for you guys? Because you're, you're looking at the live actors, but everybody is playing back to, to what's in your hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's, that was a big change for me because first because I've never done any puppetry before doing Avenue Q most most of us didn't mm. um, and then you like through the audition process you learn how to puppeteer and so you know I, I went to school for musical theater and generally looking at someone in the eyes and so all of a sudden you're looking at them in the eyes and they're looking at your right hand and <laughs> it's disorienting at first but then you kind of just get it and it and it because you can feel like the energy you know like the, the puppet and the person become like one entire entity. And then, and then you can feed off of their energy. It doesn't matter if they're exactly looking in your pupils, you can still feel for them. Yeah, I will say it's really strange if there's ever a moment where <laughs> we, by accident, bump into, you know, like there'll be human contact all of a sudden by accident. <laughs> like someone bumped mine, I was like, oh, so strange. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, do you think it's weird? Uh, for the audience to be watching the puppets versus you? Or, or do you find that the audience watches one versus the other? I can answer that question as a person who saw the show. I didn't want to see Avenue Q well before I was in it. I had some friends coming in town. They wanted to see. I'm like, any Broadway show, 
Avenue Q, the show with the puppets. Come on, we're in New York, let's see any show. And we went to see Avenue Q, and I laughed from the first word on from BA in English to all the way through. And at first you're like, wait, what's going on? You look at the puppets, you kind of look at the people, and it's amazing, especially when the puppet is right beside the person's face, and you see the same expression on the person in a puppet. And ha by gay, I think for me, I don't even remember when it switched, but it, I started looking the, at the puppet. Maybe every now and again you would look at the person, but they really do become one thing. So in the beginning you're like, I don't know, but early on in the show you just, it just all melts and it's, it's amazing. It's just Rick Lyon, the original designer uh, and original Nikki Trek of the Puppets, had a great metaphor for it. He said, watching the first five minutes of Avenue Q is very much like watching a foreign film with subtitles. <laughs> yeah. Because it, for the first five minutes, you're very aware of doing this. <laughs> and then after a while, it just becomes part of the storytelling and you don't yeah. notice it. That's so. perfect. Mm -hmm. yeah. I like that. So why do you think the show works so well? Um, this is the first puppeteering show that I've seen, or shows with puppets, where, where the the puppeteers are in complete full view and part of the show. Like, why, why does that work here? Well, Jen might actually have more views. Yeah, the first time I started doing the show as a puppeteer, I, ha I remembered asking, uh, I remembered asking the, the puppeteers on the first day of rehearsal, by the way, how are we doing this? Are we doing this or are we doing this? Because as a puppeteer, because I have a, a puppetry background as well as an acting background, I'm used to the puppeteer having to be somewhat neutral and not being seen. And they said, no, 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 we want this because we want it to be you know, sort of open to interpretation. Your face is the subtle expression of what's happening with the puppet. But since I'm second-handing somebody, I thought, well, I can't be upstaging them and doing crazy stuff with my face because the person doing the voice is there and they're acting and they're doing that. So I'm just going to do my thing. So I was just trying to be as neutral as I could be. And when we were still off Broadway, one of the uh, audience members who was a friend of our stage manager came up to me and said, are you having fun? And I said, I'm having a great time, why? And they said, because I was so distracted by looking at your face, you didn't seem like you were emotionally connecting with what was happening. I was like, oh, I, okay, I guess I have to up my face game <laughs> and uh, become part of it. So, so it, was, it was definitely a transition you know, from, from that puppetry world, but it's so liberating because I also puppeteer on Sesame Street and we end up using TV monitors down on the ground and we used, we're used to puppeteering like this. Actually, we're usually on the floor and you gotta tilt your head sideways to get your head out of the shot and you're looking at the monitor and this is generally how we puppeteer. So being able to do it from here and not having to worry about getting me out of the shot, oh, it was heaven, it was wonderful. But then I had to learn how to coordinate what was happening with my feet, with my hands and that was a whole other challenge. <laughs> Lip syncing in one rhythm and dancing in another, that's... Uh, that's a lot. So what's the weirdest thing that any of you with the puppets have had to learn to do with the puppets? What was the most challenging? Uh, sex. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because, I mean, that was the most fun for me to figure out. <laughs> it's really, I mean, it's art it's so much, yeah. essentially. But there's so much choreography. So much. There's a part in the show where they're having sex. He's not having sex with the puppet. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, oh, yeah. very important oh, distinction. I'll clarify that right now. <laughs> I thought that was that was understood. <laughs> Some people may have not seen it yet. Yeah. At one point, when I first joined the show, I was in the ensemble as well, and I had to puppeteer Trekkie Monster's silhouette in a window. And he is. Can I say? Can, yeah. can I say? Okay, he was. Ma he's masturbating. And I had to practice and practice and practice. They were like, it's not believable. And I was like, I don't know how to do this. I was like, it's so hard. No, I mean, it is hard. But um, <laughs> that was my weird moment. It's only practice baiting until you master it. I will say, as a person acting with a puppet, the weirdest thing is getting the eye, the hair out of their eyes, and they don't even notice. Anybody else? Huh? They don't notice that hair is in the Oh, you, you brush the hair out of their yeah, eyes? Yeah, I'm like, you don't feel that in your... Well, I'm constantly doing that with Kate. <laughs> Kate's, I mean, the way that Kate's hair is, it's always... Good. Well, it's usually Trekkie. Always. I help him out. And oh. He's a mess. I actually have a question for Jason, because uh, as, as far as tag team partnering, now, had you puppeteered prior to this show? No. So how was that process for you? Uh, that's been a very interesting process, actually. Yeah. Doing two, I guess I don't need this. Um, two, uh, I did two regional productions before joining the company here. So that was like my, uh, 
yeah, my training to, to puppeteer. Um, and the first production I did was directed by Rick Lyon, who originated these roles and is the puppet designer. Um, so that was like my, my real training as a puppeteer. And since then, and now that you're here, I guess I've done the show with, not, including swings and whatnot, done the show with nine different uh, second-handers. And it's a real, it's so much fun, really. It's kind of exhilarating having new people uh, because everyone, even though it's just a hand, there's so much more than just a hand. Is it's everybody like a, different? They, they the second whole, hand Oh, yeah. Different? I mean, you know, everything we do, as you, you saw in, in the numbers, is there's a lot of it that's very set and choreographed. Um, but people bring, people have, people are different, and people bring different energies to to the work. And uh, the way that, that Jen and I do a sort of gesture like this is different than how me and others would do it. Uh, and it's kind of exhilarating work with different people and to like have that different energy and to do the same material but and that may look exactly the same I guess from an audience standpoint but in it feels very different. So do the puppets themselves ever make mistakes? <laughs> Occasionally like a, an, an eye will pop off or something like that <laughs> and it's it happened once in Vegas and it was the most disturbing thing ever. And <laughs> the audience is just like, because <gasps> you really, you kind of like fall in love with these puppets as people and their characters are so well written that like all of a sudden, oh, this is bad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the rods, arm, the rods rod come Those off. Those are the best. The bad idea, Bear's arm came off one time uh, and, and Christian, who was puppeteering, it just sort of flung it in the thing. <laughs> <laughs> and then he had his and then he had his bear just rub the stump. <laughs> wow. The I want to switch to the audition process, I guess. So, um uh, most of you, all of you except one are new. So, the audition process for this, how different was it from the other shows that you've auditioned for? Who's going? Am I going? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, I mean, it was one of the longer audition processes I've ever been through. I auditioned for the first time in 2007, and then I ended up joining this company in 2011. So I think I went in a total of seven different times and had done what they call puppet camp, which is something that they do is if you've been through a couple of different callbacks and the casting office has said, oh, they'd probably be good at this, they put you through a sort of a week-long week um, puppet boot camp and to see if you can pick up some of the you know, basic skills um, that would have to be really focused on. Um, so I did that in 2007. What are the basic skills? Um, your eye focus, your neutral, the, the positions that your puppet hand should be resting in when they're not gesturing, they always have to come back to a neutral. Um, focus. Keeping uh, it straight. Like the position, position, yeah, the sink. Oh, there it is. Sink. Jen taught me how to puppeteer. <laughs> um, and the sink, the, the lip sync that you're working on with matching the puppet's mouth to your mouth. Basically, focus, gravity, and breath. Gravity. Focus is where the puppet's looking. Gravity has to do with their posture, where ground is. And breath also includes lip sync, but also a sigh, like Rod does so beautifully at the top of gay. Thank you. Uh. <laughs> do any of you, like, get, did you get any practice puppets or did you go home and, like, sit in a mirror with a sock? You know, they give you, for the, for the actual audition, they give you two little ping pong balls with little eyes on them. And then you, you can bring those home. And so I started, <laughs> it's like a little elastic around that. And then you, you just focus on trying to just move your, your thumb instead of, like, your whole up, like, the top part of your hand so that the, the puppet doesn't, like do this like weird thing with his head. Um, so you like practice that and then I actually, when I first booked the job I was a, a vacation swing and they allowed me to take home um, one of like the old, old Princetons. And so I was practicing with an old Princeton at home for like the months leading up to going back in for Princeton Rod and finally um, booking that job. How many, how many different sets of puppets are there? Is there the, the you said old Rod? Or old Princeton. Oh, retired. It, there's very tired. There's yeah. 44 working puppets in the show, and then there's a bunch of old puppets that are used for different things, practice, press events, rehearsals, things like that. So they get cosmetic facelifts every now and then, and yeah, he like comes in I'm new felt. More about that. Yeah. Actually, no, I, I, oh. I don't schedule is for refurbishing them or what the what they, they do he makes them very well rarely do they need anything but yeah well like Lucy Bible Lucy just got a new a new wig recently 
the Trekkie you saw today is new as of a couple of few months ago. Yeah. He's he's a brand new Trekkie. That Their fur is fluffier, you know, things. They, they get worn a lot from being in the show. But um, but it's kind of astonishing yeah. that it, after 10 years, yeah. we're really on only like third generation of these puppets. Yeah. Because yeah. they are made. And they take, each one of them takes take about it. 120 man hours. Uh, they're all crafted by hand. And they cost thousands and thousands of dollars. Yeah. That's the genius of Rick really? Lyon. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. So what's I mean? What's everybody the assumes that you can make a puppet for like a hundred bucks, and it's like no, oh, wow. no, sorry. <laughs> on these <laughs> sock and ping pong balls. That's pretty yeah. cheap, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what's on the inside though? You said it's it's elastic, so the mouth closes on its own. Is that neutral? No, that was the. No, the no the that's just the, the, oh, the ping, ping pong balls. Oh, that was like the practice thing that they gave you for the audition. It was just like ping pong balls and elastic elastic band. So unless you were but there, the actual puppet is made of a bunch of different, like so many different materials: foam, foam, foam fleece, and rubber cardboard. gaskets inside yeah. the mouth for the palate, for the hard palate. So there's a hard palate that's shaped like a V. Then there's a ring that your thumb fits in. Then there's occasionally a little bridge, sort of like the fret of a guitar, mm-hmm. that's on the top palate that helps anchor your hand in there. And then there's a foam brain inside. I mean, it's it's we have like three different types of puppets. We have some that have rods, so that they have arms that come out, and they have rods, like how rod is, so that you can do this. Then there's the live hands, live, live hand hands. puppets, and then we have boxes at one point that come to Triggers. life, and say, and that's like a trigger gun, and they do that. So what you see in like Lion King and stuff like that, yeah. that has a lot of trigger puppets. So boxes are the only trigger puppets, right, that are in our show. Mm-hmm. And you can see the triggers too. You know, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. all completely out there exposed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So during during the audition process, there was anything any mistakes that you made during the audition process that you that you take with you to your yeah. your future auditions if you're auditioning? I don't want to get anyone in trouble. <laughs> uh, well, my well my whole experience with Avenue Q started when I first saw the show back when I was a sophomore in high school, and I remember putting this awful video on YouTube of me singing Purpose. <laughs> And then, which is like the, the main song that I guess Princeton sings in the show. And uh, I put it on YouTube and I got information back on Facebook by Jeff Marks, who's one of the writers of the show. And we started Facebooking and we were talking throughout my high school career. And then we like stopped talking after a while. We just like lost, cut, lost touch. And then um, randomly like I got the show. I hadn't talked to him in like forever. And I got the show, and I like Facebooked him again. And I was like, "Just so you know, I'm I'm like the lead in your show. I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna be in an Avenue Q." And he was like, "What? That's crazy!" And he like came back and saw me, and we like had like this big reunion because I had actually never met him. We were just Facebooking. Um, I don't know how that happened. How that has anything? We've actually queued this. That wasn't my question it's at all, but story. but it was a good story. I wanted to tell it. <laughs> no, we've a- they've actually queued up that video, Darren. We're gonna watch it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wish we had that. High school. Uh, so let's talk about racism. Mm. Danielle. Um, <laughs> I'll help. <laughs> <laughs> <That's good. laughs> so uh, obviously thing. the show deals with racism and sexuality and bringing a lot of issues to the surface and then putting them like right there comically in people's faces. Uh, I mean, do you think do you think there's a bigger meaning to the show or is it all just for fun? Oh, I Definitely. think there's there's tons of I, I this show I think is is one of the rare times it's I it's a, I could say this it's a perfect musical it's written from top to bottom and it's uh, the, the the life lessons that you learn in life are kind of portrayed on the stage and it's it's stuff that nobody really talks about sometimes and uh, when they come to see the show I think sometimes people get a little offended especially the racist and then they laugh despite themselves and they're like, oh, it's okay, we're okay. Like, you know, <laughs> everyone's a little bit racist and it's fine, you know? And I think that's, that's the joy of the show. It kind of, it does put real life in front of you and then you... So you think people walk out of the show with a greater, I uh, guess, awareness or, or appreciation for oh, things? Sure. Yeah. Um, has the show ever gotten any blowback? Have you got anything, any blowback from, <laughs> from anything? You remember, I guess, initially, if the songs were like... Too offensive. Oh, people a, have gotten up and, and left. Yeah. Oh yeah. We had a we had a bunch so of people much. that were from a from a um a a, a, cri- a church came. Yeah, we it, had it was, nuns in the audience. Yeah, <laughs> and they did not stay for Act Two. Or if we have children. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you never know. It's always There's, exciting to see when we're gonna lose them, if we're gonna lose them. Ah, there we go. If we don't <laughs> lose them by porn, Bye. then they're gonna say, "Oh, we'll get them with loud." We've had moments where there'll be kids right front in center and we're like, oh God, I'm so sorry. You're gonna have so many questions for your mom when you go home. <laughs> Here it is. 
<laughs> like two year olds. There was yeah. a yeah. woman. Yeah. There was a woman who left, I think, two weeks ago, and and our sound guy Josh was like, when she left halfway through Act One, she was like, "This place needs to be burned to the ground." <laughs> And like walked out, and he was that was hysterical. Right. He's like, "I'll see you there." <laughs> <laughs> so the okay, the the death of Gary Coleman, oh. uh, the real life death. What, yeah. How did how did you deal with that within you the know, show? It's funny. Um, I did the show. I started the show with the first national tour. I did the entire tour, and we would all make jokes like, because he had gotten sick before he passed, and we're like, "Oh my God, Gary, hold on, I need a job." You know, "Oh my God, what will happen?" And then like it really happened, and. I was Gary Coleman the day that he died. And you would think that I would be nervous for my job, but I was just so nervous and so afraid. And a lot of the producers and Jeff Whitty, the writer, called me and he said, well, we've released a statement and we're going to um, say something at the end of the show. Um, and so I was just talking to him and telling him about how I felt about the show. And he was like, okay, I'm not going to write anything. You can just say what you just said. And I'm like, what? And Sala was doing the show. And we get It was to beautiful. We get to the theater, and I'm like, I'm so nervous, I'm so scared, and I'm in the bathroom, like, crying, trying to figure out what I want to say, and I'm nervous because as soon as I come out, I'm going to say, that's Gary Coleman. Yes, I am. And I'm like, are they going to boo me? And I I was shaking so much, and I come out on the, the fire escape, and I say, yes, I am, and the audience applauses, and I'm like, it's okay, it's okay. And so we just say, which is honestly the truth, like, Gary's had a really bad deal and he never came to see the show we tried to get him to come see the show i understand why he wouldn't but i wish that he would have because gary is depicted in such a, a great way on the avenue of avenue q he has friends he has people who have become his family and he has a lot of advice to give the younger people and so we just said that and we will continue to honor his legacy by making people laugh and do what he loved to do every day so it was kind of weird but it ended up being okay and so we did that uh i did that speech for the week after he died and so he still lives, and I think it's, it's a He's good... He's also got the most life experience in the show. Yeah. And no one's had it harder than Gary Coleman. No. So he has the probably the a lot of the, I mean, save for the, the therapist, but he has a lot of good advice for the for the young kids coming to New York, so... Yeah. Right, so, okay, Jennifer, you, you were in the show in its original six-year run on Broadway, correct? And then you left and then came back, right? Yeah. Right, so what made you come back? Well, part of it was, uh, first of all, we didn't know until closing night on Broadway that we weren't really closing. No. That we were just moving across the street to New World Stages. We didn't know that. So I had already booked another job. Because I was like, well, this gig's over. It's been a lovely six years. I better figure out what the heck is next. <laughs> so I already had a gig. Um, so I was doing that. Uh, and and I've been, in, in the years since, I've been exploring other horizons. I've been doing things just as a human. Uh, I got to do a season down at Alabama Shakespeare Festival in their spring rep doing some Shakespeare and with without puppets, which was fun and challenging and exciting. Um, and it's it's nice. I've been very fortunate to be able to come back and join the company at times when they're either between cast members or if a cast member books another job that, you know, she can go leave town to do that for a little while or if somebody needs a medical cover, you know, like a medical leave, that kind of thing. And so I get to swing back into the show uh, every now and again. Actually, every calendar year since the transfer i have been yeah. there for anywhere between you know for anywhere between a couple of weeks and a couple of months and it's just lovely it's like it's like coming home again what i will say about avenue q is because it's so well written and there's so much heart in the show that all of us who who have ever done it before feel that it bleeds out throughout granted we do say some things that are inappropriate in our real lives because it's what we do on stage but we also really love each other in the company from the top to bottom crew um stage management our producers it's a family and so like we are a family so you go and you come back for the holidays you go and you come back that's what avenue mm -hmm. q is it's it really is a show with heart and the people that are involved the company that are involved we have heart and we are a family really on avenue q it, it, it's not even a joke it's the honest to god truth it takes like a certain specific weirdo to be in the show but we're <laughs> we're very lovable happy weirdos and we have a good time <laughs> <laughs> so jen you go around you, you teach you teach regional productions of the show right you teach them the puppetry yeah i have actually uh started doing that um i've been going around and coaching different uh, mostly university productions uh but i got to direct a production of the show for the first time earlier this year at the adirondack theater festival up in glens falls new york which was a whole other experience uh and challenging and fun I love working with new puppeteers um, and and watching them, first of all, discover how hard it is 
because everyone that you see here is at a level where they make it look so easy that people just assume that anybody can do it. But really, it's like learning a foreign language. And when people do that boot camp that Veronica was talking about, by the end of one week of working for six hours a day, if they're lucky, they've learned how to say, hello, my name is, where's the bathroom in this foreign language. The vocabulary may not be right, the conjugation may not be right, but at least they're communicating an idea. Uh, so, so it is like you're taking an immersion class. And I love watching puppeteers, first of all, discover that, but then discover their own potential within it. And then it watch them translate from what is this foreign object on my arm to being able to make acting choices through the puppet and watching that open up things in them that they wouldn't have been able to tap necessarily just as a human. So the, the regional theater, uh, the regional productions or the university productions, do they make their own puppets or do you have, do they license or, or how does there's, that work? There's a couple of different things. Uh, uh, the production I directed, I ended up renting a set from Rick Lyon, who has a set that he rents out. Um, MTI, Musical Theater International, uh, who does the rights for the show, they have their own set of puppets that somebody built. Um, <laughs> And so there's that set available. Um, <laughs> and actually, the one that I just did, uh, at the, at the one that I just coached out at University of Utah, um, the, the costume designer who works there, she's the costume professor. She and I worked together at, at Alabama, at Alabama Shakespeare Festival, and she knew what I did. She said, hey, um, I'm actually designing puppets. So the, the fall semester of this past academic year, they actually put the show on, but the previous spring semester, the costume designer's crafts class and costume class made these puppets based on her designs and had another puppeteer friend of mine and colleague, a, a woman by the name of Honey Good Enough. That is her name. And I believe she has it trademarked because it's a great name. Um, but uh, uh, so she went out and helped them learn how to build them. So there's a bunch of different ways to do it. It's mostly, other, and, and there are other puppet companies out there. I think Swazzle, Swazzle Puppet Company out in California rent sets. Uh, I think it's a little dicey in terms of rights and designs and all of that. And I honestly can't speak to the legality and logistics and issues of that. But uh, I would recommend to anyone who's considering doing it that they might want to start by contacting Rick Lyon and see if his set of puppets are available because they're the original designs. So. Very nice. Uh, and they're very puppeteerable, because you can make a puppet look good, but if it's a, I mean, but if you haven't worked out the inner mechanics of it, it won't move very well. So anyway, just a plug for people who know how to design and build puppets. It's not We've got all sorts of of groups and internal interests. So I'm sure there's there's some puppeteers here. I'm sure I, we've got jugglers clubs and everything else. So cool. Yeah. Um, Darren, congratulations. This is your off-Broadway debut, right? It is, yes, yes thank you. Um, so, I mean, this kind of goes back a little bit to the audition process we were talking about. Like, how, how long did it take for you to get used to sharing the stage, I guess, or not being just yourself up there, of having people not look at you all the time? Does oh, that make sense? Like, like having share, a puppet along with me? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that was, that was interesting. But um, for some reason, having a puppet next to me uh, allowed me to get in my body a little bit more for some reason. Um, I don't know. I, I think while being in his, while being in, in his, right? Because like I can look at like this external piece and like uh, and like visually, you know, dissect it and whatever, and, and figure out which way, like which um, which things kind of look better, and and how to I don't know find some emotion in it. But that allows me to like connect that from like this external thing into the rest of my body for some reason. Because I'm just a, I'm a very lanky person. I have long arms. My wingspan is longer than how tall I am. And so <laughs> having, I guess, this all connected allowed me to um, not worry about um, like how much space I was taking up and allow me to allow the puppet to take up the space. And then that transferred into the rest of my body. Cool. Uh, so, okay, Veronica, mm -hmm. um, Kate Monster, and Lucy the Slut. Mm -hmm. How much fun for you is it to is it to be able to play both the innocent ingenue and the sex crazed? It's soldiers? really fun. Um, I get to use two completely different facets of my voice. Um, both of their voices are very different, but it's probably one of the most challenging parts of the show for me. There are several scenes where. Um, I am both voicing Kate and Lucy in the same scene, talking to each other, and then Jen will be either um, 
puppeting Kate or Lucy, so I will literally have conversations with myself. <laughs> 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 um, so that can get a little a little challenging, and it's a little brain teaser for yourself. So if there's ever a moment where I'm not completely focused, um, I'll, I'll notice that <laughs> I've started to, to say the wrong thing. Um, but yeah, Keeps I mean, me on my toes. Really, yeah, yeah, me too. <laughs> um, it's really fun though. Um, it's nice. It's nice to be able to switch it up. So are you more like Kate or Lucy in real life? Yeah. yeah. Um, probably mostly Kate. She's she's a, she's like the heart character. I think I have a little sass in me as well from Lucy, but generally, I think I think Kate. So did you ever feel slightly silly at first, like having puppets make puppets have well, sex? Oh yeah. I mean, <laughs> I felt I still feel a little. Oh, yeah. A little wonky sometimes. I mean, I, I don't feel con completely 100% confident with my puppeteering ever, and I've been doing it for two and a half years now. Um, I still am always checking. Where is she looking? What's going on? What's happening? Um, I, I have to be focused the entire time. <laughs> Otherwise, something will go wrong. <laughs> yeah. So for, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, but to be fair, I have to too. Yeah. Yeah, I've been doing this for a yes. long, long time, and I'm I still am checking in and going, okay, uh, am I looking in the right place? No, I'm not. Oh, thank. Uh. Yeah. So that's that's a continuous process. Well, that's good to know. Yeah. Do you enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> do you, so for the two of you that do the the two-handed puppets, do you find it more enjoyable or easier to have like uh, I guess literally somebody to lean on, or would you <laughs> do you prefer to to have just your own puppet, or or you know what's what's the difference for you? That's a really good question. Um, I mean, being alone with a puppet, it gives you more freedom, certainly, because there's less that is uh, like set and choreographed and that you like have to do this move on this line or something. But there's still freedom within choreography, obviously. Um, I, I don't think, I, I don't know if I could say what I would prefer because it's, it almost, it actually almost feels, a, there's, Specifically with Trekkie, Nikki's a little different. I think maybe it's just because his, if she's not with me, Nikki's hand gets stuffed and pinned to his side so that he looks like Kate and, and Princeton or you know whomever that just has one hand available. Trekkie, be just the nature of the sack of fur that he is, doesn't get that. His arm just hangs limp from overuse, I like to say. Um, <laughs> but there's actually times, I, some, especially when I first started the show, We'd rehearse and rehearse, uh, doing regional productions, and we'd rehearse for like four weeks, always with this person with me, doing the internet for porn and, and whatever. And then I'd come out into a scene like uh, Lucy's number in the cafe, and I'm by myself because the second hander is doing Kate Monster while she's doing Lucy. And so I'm sitting there on a bench by myself, and it almost feels like half empty because you, I'm, you're like used to this other to another person bringing this extra life and like filling in the rest of this character. And then you're kind of just there uh, solo, flying solo, and it almost feels, at the beginning at least, feels a little weird. There's a moment of like, oh, I can do whatever the hell I want now. Oh, I, I'm not held down by this other person. But then it's like, oh, I miss my other person. <laughs> I wish my other person were here to help me. I will say as an understudy, I've gone on for these roles like hundreds of times at this point, but when I was first going on for Trekkie Monster, it was really, really nice to have the second person next to you to like calm your nerves yeah. because you're like freaking out because you haven't done the role in three months or whatever, but also to like push you around the stage to make sure you're going to the right spot. Um, so it was also, <laughs> yeah. it was always really comfortable, comforting to have a person behind you. How much rehearsal goes into the, the two-handed puppets? Oh, a lot, a lot. More, a more lot, than the lot. single? Uh, well, I would. I, I can't say that per se. But it's just a different kind of rehearsal. Um, uh, when I came back into the show, and having done the show for as long as I have, you'd think that it's like, oh, well, you don't really need rehearsal. You just need to pick up and go. But uh, I, because I'd never worked with Jason before, and I've worked with probably about twenty different people in that partnership, if I include vacation swings and covers and understudies and everything. Um, and everybody's gestural language is so different that I need to say, especially because of what I do in the show where I'm supporting the person who's doing the voice, I'm supporting that performance. So, and what's nice is the best partnerships are when I get to have a little input too and we sort of create it together. But very often, you know, I just have to sort of go with what the other person's doing. So, 
when I start with a new Nikki Trekkie, if I've had it, if I haven't had a chance to watch them, sometimes I'll say, let me just step out and watch you. Or better still, give me the puppet and let me see how you would move as a human doing this scene so that I can observe your gestural language and try to help translate it into the puppet and distill it into its essence of how I can do that and match it. Um, so so there's there's a lot of that kind of rehearsal. But as for the for the individual puppets, especially when people are, are starting to learn, it that's just the intensity of all those three basic principles and, and being in the mirror, and then you have to get away from the mirror. And so it's it's a it's a it's a heck of a process, it really is. Daniil, why do you think the creators of the show chose your character to be Gary Coleman specifically? Mm -hmm. You don't see the resemblance? <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, <laughs> Avenue Q is loosely based on Sesame Street, and on Sesame Street, sometimes you have celebrity guests who come on and help the puppets teach the children about, you know, life lessons. So, of course, on Avenue Q, the celebrity would be washed up and Gary Coleman, and so it's funny at first, um, but eventually it, it, Gary has a point. And I believe at first they wanted to have... I believe in the reading it was a white woman that played, who read it, a friend of the, one of the creators, but, and I think they may have wanted to have different kind of celebrities come in and out, but, you know, Gary Coleman just stuck because he's pretty awesome and well, an I'm, awesome character, um, but it's like having a guest celebrity help teach these life lessons, but not really the best celebrity status. Well, and that was also back when this was originally created. The The idea was that it would be a television show. So there would be different guests uh, that came onto each episode. But I think part of the reason, too, why Gary Coleman specifically is the show basically was created. The creators said, look, OK, when you're a kid and you're watching children's television in Sesame Street, you learn that you're special and you should dream big and all of your dreams will come true. And isn't that wonderful? And then you go to college and you graduate. And you're living back at home with your parents and you're temping and you're going, well, where's the Sesame Street for me now? Because I'm sort of disillusioned by the earlier Sesame Street that I had watched. You know, what what it's so so you're you're it's a little sadder but wiser kind of idea. It's about innocence, uh, about a bit of lost innocence. And I think that Gary being a child star and then growing out of that into well, what happens after that is in the same track as the people who grew up watching Sesame Street and then are faced with that reality of, well, what happens now? And that's why he can teach so many lessons to Princeton and everybody else because he's been there and back and then some. And still looks at it positively. Sometimes, you know, Gary has his moments, but for the most part, you know, life lesson. We have a song called Schadenfreude, which, you know, and Gary was pretty much living that, you know, <laughs> taking pleasure in other people's pain, you know, and we have a purpose. So that's pretty If cool. you could do one of the puppeted characters, who, who would you be? <sighs> well, I love Kate Monster, and I think I'm a little bit of Lucy on the inside, so I think if it was a puppet, <laughs> don't, don't, don't do it. <laughs> so if it were, it would be Kate and Lucy, but I must be very honest, my favorite character in this show is Christmas Eve, and it is my dream to be Christmas evening in one of these shows. <laughs> I'm just saying. Do it. Because I think that Christmas Eve has a sister from the West Indies whose name is Christmas <laughs> Evening, and she could come and teach people on Avenue Q lessons, too. <laughs> I smell spin-offs. <laughs> so I'm going to ask a few more questions. If, again, in the audience, you guys have anything, line up at the, uh, at the mics here. Um, so I don't think there's a, a single person that goes on stage with one puppet, correct? Like everybody plays multiple ones? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess this is similar to a swing or puppet, puppety swing or something, but how, how hard is it to, to switch between the puppet characters? And some of you in the same scene. Uh, I think when you are learning it at yeah. first, yeah. it's difficult to figure it out. But then once you kind of get it in your body, the puppets themselves feel so different. Like Rod, the way that he's built, he just feels a lot different than Princeton. So the voices just come out differently. And you just kind of get it. It's like messing up a, a, a regular line for someone else. It's uh, At that point, it would be like after doing it for a year and a half, you know, you don't really mess up a lot of lines, unless you're me. Yeah, question. But, <laughs> 
Hi, saw the show twice. It was just completely amazing. Oh. I'm curious uh, about the evolution of the show. This is obviously a very polished show after all this time, but are there elements that are still being dropped or things that just happen spontaneously that then become part of the show? Uh, could you comment a little bit about that and maybe give us some stories of things that... We have didn't a one line at the end of the show that uh, we will switch out uh, depending on what's going on in world news or you know politics and things like that. Uh, the line used to be when it first started was George Bush is only for now. Uh, so obviously we had to change that and we've tried other things. Um, now you have to come to the show to see what <laughs> <laughs> And obviously we made a few changes when Gary Coleman died. So we just switched a couple of lines. Yeah. But yeah, and I then, think, yeah. sorry, no, I was no. going to say generally most things, I mean, there's no major changes that have been made. But as new cast members come in, they are pretty great about allowing um, you know, your your own personal choices as an actor to sort of change and shape the scene, different beats that you would take um, that are pretty flexible. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 It, ge generally speaking, though, once the show is open, it's it's technically locked. Yeah. Uh, in, in there, because in the, in the preview process, it's changing all the time. Once opening night happens, the show is technically <laughs> locked. So for the first four years that we were on Broadway, the script was pretty much exactly the same. Then after the Las Vegas company opened and they made changes to fit that space and everything, I think the creative team just said, hey, you know what? Now we've had a chance to revisit this material. We have some things we like better. So we actually re-teched the show and incorporated 53 changes from the Las Vegas show. Um, uh, we had to, new lighting, new orchestrations, new lines. Um, so, but that's rare. It, it, that, that, and from, from that standpoint, that doesn't happen very often. But within the confines of the show, as Veronica said, there, there is some play. And, uh, you know, so that, There's that's one song called Mixtape, where Princeton makes a mixtape for Kate. And it used to be a cassette, but now it's, it's a decade later. So, you know, it probably shouldn't even be a CD anymore. It should be. <laughs> like, 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 it's a whole So it's a little behind, but that's... <laughs> Closest yeah. they could get. Well, and especially with like long running shows, there's definitely going to be, you know, if you're in a long running show, you you want to find new ways to explore and find new laughs and new moments, and you know, uh, it's I think it's inevitable with long running shows that, that we have to find some way to keep it fresh and keep it, you know, moving forward and and. Yeah. We will have rehearsals. Um, there are consistent understudy rehearsals, but also our resident director, John Tartaglia, who originated the role of Princeton and Rod, um, will come in to sort of do a brush up and sort of work on, you know, he'll take notes at the show the night before. And if there's any scenes that he's like, this is falling a little flat, we're going to have to work on this, just zhuzh it up a little bit. Minor, minor changes, mostly about us and acting choices and stuff like that. But a lot of times it's reminders. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just be like, remember, this is what this scene is about. You right, know? something we talked about a year ago. Let's re-implement that. Yeah. Great. And we, usually right. have, we usually have some freedom when a new second-hander comes in or even a second-hander that's been in for a while if things start to feel stale uh, to think, oh, well, well, let's try, we could do this little move here. We could try this little move. Um, and Johnny's been very generous t with me about that, especially things with, with the two, with the double live hands puppets. It's like, because it's all very set and choreographed, it's like a game of telephone. It's like passed down from like 20 Nikki Trekkies ago. And it doesn't necessarily fit what I'm doing with the role. So Johnny's been very good about like, go look in the mirror and go come up with something else. And next time I come see the show, I'll let you know if it works or if you have to go look in the mirror and come with something else again. All right, so uh, yeah, final question. Why did the Vegas show have such a short run? You guys know? Um, there's a couple reasons. I think it was, it was initially, we were selling actually pretty well in Vegas. It was hard for them to figure out how to market our show in Vegas, specifically because it was a, it was a, a New York, themed show and things like that um, and they had some very creative things but it was just it was one of those things that you know Vegas is very transient there's a lot of people coming in and out um, and most of the shows are an hour and a half in Vegas ours was two hours and so we ended up shortening it and um, the other thing is uh, I believe Steve Wynn had already put in play the Spamalot to come into his theater and so they had to get that theater ready for Spamalot and so we were there for about nine months um, we all, we, I think, from what I understand, we sold very well, and the, the, the local people in Vegas loved us, and they came to see it multiple times. And I think, you know, the theater was, I think it was like 1,200 seats. So it was, it was a big theater, and um, 
I, you know, I th I'd like to think that our, our run in Vegas was pretty successful, even though we were only there for about nine months. I mean, to be honest, to be an actor and have a nine-month job anywhere <laughs> is, is amazing. And then, you know, all the perks that we had out there with, like, housing and, you know, we were celebrities in Vegas. Everywhere we went, we'd have bottle service everywhere. And they'd be like, oh, you're in Avenue Q. Let's, oh, let's bring you over here. We want you to meet these people. It was, very, it was, it was like be, living the life of a celebrity. It was like an amazing job. And um, but it was it was it was a lot of fun, and it was you know it brought me into the Avenue Q family, and I've been with it almost ever since. So, well, again, thank you guys very much for for coming out. Yes. And that's it. That's a wrap. Cool. Thank you. Thanks.